regime that we're dealing with is no longer as fluid as it was in 2017 when there was that coup or not a coup, whatever it was, um, in 2017. It's now actually taking a form. It's no longer as fluid. So the things that are happening now, from the patriotic bill to the cybersecurity bill to the constitutional amendment bill number two, all of those things that are happening now, we must be able to look at them from a political, from a legal, as well as from an activist perspective, because they are speaking into um, a broader political playground. Um, and I think that it's very important that we understand that political context, because everything kind of makes sense when we look at things from that perspective. Um, that having been said, um, I want to start from a place where I talk about the COVID-19 lockdown um, and, and the crisis that was there globally and, and, and internationally. I think the one thing that we have experienced and we have seen is an insurgence of uh, rogue states that have used this period to settle old political schools with political opponents, um, as well as to, um, you know, use their power um, for whatever repression or for whatever political agenda. And this has been true in Zimbabwe as it has been in Egypt, as it has been in all of these other countries, not just in Africa, but also around the world. So um, it, we have to understand things in context because the patriotic bill, the constitutional amendment bill number two, and the cyber security bill were all proposed during the COVID-19 lockdown. That's when we really saw them being pursued. And what is the reasoning behind that? Because it makes no sense for such important um, you know, legislation to be you know, pursued at a time when people are practically incapacitated to fully and effectively and meaningfully participate in the process of making those particular laws. And the intention basically is hinged upon exclusionary tactics. That's number one. You know, this has been an elusive process that is very secretive, uh, fast-tracked, and divisive. And that's just, you know, what puts people off. So in as much as I've met people that have argued that in constitutional amendment bill number two, there are some good things. Let's be open-minded about this. The same thing with the cybersecurity bill. Oh, there are some good things. Let's be open-minded about this. Um, I think that as long as, um, you know, the process, I mean, the procedural aspects to which we are um, attaining these pieces of legislation are littered with exclusionary tactics and are excluding the broad majority of citizens from participating and constructing, um, you know, those legal frameworks that are then going to be used to govern people that are then going to be used, um, you know, on those people. Um, then it becomes problematic if you know, the process is not democratized and the process is not as inclusive as possible. So this has been my major query with 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 most of 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 of, of these bills. Um, I'm just going to touch a little bit on the patriotic bill. Um, you know, there's a very strong tension between some of those bills and the provisions of the 2013 Constitution. I think with the patriotic bill, it, and the tension is with Section 67 of the Constitution. It speaks in political rights that you know citizens have, and what is essentially you know, scary is that this patriotic bill uh, was recommended to cabinet by the National Peace and Reconciliation Commission. And it is basically criminalizing the, the private correspondence, um, you know, of citizens with 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 foreign governments. Um, I, you know, this becomes problematic in the context of accountability. And I think Rose did an, an amazing job at explaining, um, you know, how this would work and how this would play out. So I'm not going to repeat that. I'll just then quickly jump into the aspects around the cybersecurity bill. 